G'day everyone, welcome to Lubrication Explained, and today I'm going to be talking about intermolecular forces. Now this is probably a subject that you covered in high school chemistry, but if you're like me, high school was a little while ago and you've since forgotten a lot of the terms. The reason I want to cover this is because um, over the next couple of videos I'm going to talk about the solubility of lubricants and the miscibility of lubricants, and unless you understand the fundamentals of intermolecular forces, it's going to be very difficult to explain solubility and miscibility kind of from first principles. So anyway, let's get into it. All right, we're going to start by talking about bonds. Now, you've probably heard all kinds of terms around bonds. You've probably heard them kind of, you know, I've talked about it being nonpolar and polar bonds. And then with polar bonds, you can kind of split them into hydrogen hydrogen bonds and just basic uh, polar bonds. But when we talk about all of these different types of bonds between molecules, what we're really interested in from a solubility and miscibility standpoint is the strength of the bond, because the strength of the bond determines, you know, how much they attract each other. And at the kind of scale that we're looking at, so the, when I say the scale, the distance between molecules, the predominant force that we're talking about is electrical, right? So, or Coulombic force, I guess you could call it. Um, that's the one that dominates at these kind of scales. So you also have things like the strong nuclear force, right? But that really only interacts between, let's say, for example, neutrons and protons. So on a much smaller scale, because we're talking about the nucleus of the atom. And then you've got something like gravity, which acts over vast distances, but is very weak at an intermolecular level. So at this level, we're basically talking all about charge, right? And charges attracting each other. So if we go to our, let's say, standard model of what an atom looks like, I'm going to use helium because it's just kind of one of the easier ones. You've got two neutrons at the, at the center. They have no charge, right? And then you have two protons at the center as well. They have a positive one charge. And in our you know, typical model that we first learned about in high school, there are then electrons, which are much smaller than the protons and neutrons. I put it this like this so you can see it. And they kind of, quote unquote, orbit the nucleus. Now, we know that that's not technically speaking correct, although it kind of works as a model. Those electrons are more like a probability density field. There's kind of this cloud that sort of moves around the nucleus. But for all intents and purposes, we can think of them as being, you know, points. So hopefully this model helps us kind of understand all the, all the different forces. So like I said, you know, the, the predominant force that we're looking at is, is electrical or charged. And I'm going to run some terms past you that maybe you'll recognize from high school. So we have ion-ion interactions. We have ion-dipole interactions. Uh, hydrogen bonds, which I put in brackets because they're kind of a subset of dipole-dipole interactions. And then finally, you've got London dispersion forces, sometimes generically called like uh, van der Waals uh, forces. So keep those in mind. You may remember some of those, but we're going to go through all of them and explain them. All right. First of all, what is kind of an ionic material? So if you look at the periodic table, an ionic material is generally one which takes uh, something from both sides of the periodic table, right? So, you know, your classic example would be something like sodium chloride, you know, table salt. So sodium's on one side, class is a metal, and chlorine is a non-metal. And the interaction between those two is what we would call ionic. So what this looks like is you have an Na+, plus, so it's been stripped of an electron, and you've got a chlorine atom, which has attracted, it has an extra electron. So it has a negative charge. And the two of these then attract, right? Because we have one positive and one negative charge. And so electrically there, they are attracted. Now, we can express the strength of that attraction by this equation, right? So there's a, there's a constant, and then you've got the charge one, charge two on R squared. Now, one of the things to note about that is the fact that it is proportional to the charges. And therefore, if we increase the amount of charge, let's say, for example, I use uh, magnesium oxide, because magnesium is two plus and oxygen is two minus, that's double the amount of charge, right, on each side. So technically, on an electrical level, these attract each other uh, four times more than sodium and chlorine do. Now, the other complication in that, though, is that 
size is also a factor. So it's inversely proportional to the radius squared. And oxygen is a much smaller uh, atom, and therefore um, it also is contributing to an increase in the, the attraction between the, the magnesium and the oxygen. All right, so what do um, ionic materials look like? So if you zoomed in and you had a, you know, basically a scanning electron microscope or something much more powerful, and you scanned in on uh, a salt crystal, it's actually a kind of a lattice structure of sodium and chlorine ions. And so this picture is, is kind of important because we'll come back to it a little bit later. All right, so that is ion-ion interactions. Then we have the next group of three, which are all relying on a dipole, right? So we've explained what an ion is. Now we have to explain what a dipole is because it's fundamental to the next three types of bonds. And one of the ways that I can explain this using an example that we've used in a previous video is an uh, this is a uh, an EO PAG, right? Now the reason I wanted to look at this is specifically because of the bonds between carbon and oxygen, and those little brown ones are hydrogens, right? Now a bond in this instance is when, let's look at the, the carbon-oxygen bond, they are sharing an electron pair. But as I've kind of covered in a, in a previous uh, video, the it's not an, a perfectly equal share, right? So the reason for that is, again, if we go back to the periodic table, each atom in the periodic table, or each element in the periodic table, has what's called an electronegativity value. And that's you know, in, in layman's terms is how much does it want to hold on to those electrons? So, for example, if we were to look at, you know, carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, right? We've got carbon has an electronegativity value of 2.55, oxygen is 3.44. And as a general rule, right, we say that if uh, the difference between the two is more than 0 0.5, right, then we say that there is a dipole, uh, on, on that um, bond. Now, with hydrogen, right, uh, and the reason it gets kind of its special name as a hydrogen bond is because hydrogen has a particularly low electronegativity value and its bonds with things like oxygen and fluorine are so prevalent in nature, right? So it gets a kind of a special one because it's a, a particularly strong dipole. All right, so going back to our picture of, of, of a PAG, right, that means that the oxygen is actually holding on to the electron pair more so than the carbon. Now, if we zoom in, the electronegativity values between carbon and hydrogen were not that dissimilar. And therefore, we would say that they approximately um, share those electrons equally, right? So there is no dipole between the carbon and the hydrogen. Okay, so going back um, to this model of, of the PAG, what you can see is also geometrically that the oxygen is going to hold on to those um, electrons a little bit more than both carbons on either side of it. And therefore, if you looked across the molecule, one side of that molecule is going to be negatively charged and the other side is going to be positively charged. So if we have another um, PAG molecule, which also has one side which is positively charged and another side which is negatively charged, then they're going to attract each other, right? Because opposite charges attract. And that's what we would call a dipole-dipole interaction. All right. Now we can also talk about dipole-ion interactions. So because the oxygen is negatively charged, if I had a positively charged sodium ion come along, well, it is going to be electrically uh, uh, attracted to the oxygen side of the PAG, right? And so that's what we would call a dipole ion interaction. And finally, we also have dipole hydrogen. So this is where we can form hydrogen bonds, where on water, for example, the hydrogen is positively charged and the oxygen on the PAG is negatively charged. So again, this is one of the reasons why PAGs tend to take on water, or at least water-soluble PAGs do, right? Because they can electrically attack um, attract uh, water molecules. All right, so now we've covered ion-ion, um, ion-dipole, ion hydrogen bonds, dipole-dipole, and the final one that we need to talk about is London dispersion forces. Um, so London dispersion forces are really interesting. So I'm going to take 
um, a molecule which has no dipole on it and is basically perfectly symmetrical. This is non-ane. I, I just picked it out of nowhere. Um, so it has nine carbons on its chain and it's fully saturated, right? No double bonds, no nothing. All right, now I haven't put all the electrons on here. I just want you to get an idea for, okay, we have a cloud of electrons which, which kind of surrounds uh, this molecule. Now, those electrons are not stationary. They're kind of moving in, in random patterns. So they kind of exhibit this kind of motion. Now, if we were to take a freeze frame, so if we were able to stop time and take a picture of where all those, you know, electrons are in a given moment, you know, momentarily, just by pure randomness, right, all the electrons may be on one side. And therefore, that is going to cause there to be a dipole across this, right? A very weak dipole, right? But there is one side which is more negatively charged than the other. And so, if another molecule were to come along that also doesn't have a dipole or anything like that, then the electrons or the electron clouds are going to be attracted to the positive side of the other molecule and that is what we call an induced dipole because the, the electrons have come onto one side and so that causes one side to be negatively charged, right? All right, so now we've, we've kind of explained all the different types of uh, bonds, right, between molecules. And one thing that you'll notice is that the bond strength goes down as we go down this list. And I think it's pretty easy to appreciate why that's the case, right? So ion, ion, you know, you've got one positive, one negative charge. They really want to come together and they bond very tightly. The dipole interactions is kind of a quirk of electronegativity values as well as the geometry of the molecule. And finally, you've got London dispersion forces, which kind of just happen at random. They're not all that strong and they're really dependent on the size and the surface area of the molecule. So anyway, now that we've established that, in future videos, we can go on to talk about solubility and miscibility in ways that are going to actually make sense, right? So hopefully this has been helpful. Um, if you've got questions or comments, please leave them down below. Otherwise, this has been Lubrication Explained.